Well, hello, I'm Steve, G4 Hotel Papa Echo. I'm going to tell you about my Sira Matsoni Baby Loop all the way through from purchase to on-air operation. OK, you need quite a lot of accessories. Here's a rotator cable for the Yesu rotator I decided to have with the antenna. I think it's a good idea, by the way. I recommend it. On the left-hand side here, you can see the black connector on the rotator and the white connector goes on the controller in the shack. It's a DC cable, eight pins. OK, well, the rotator came in quite a small box. No difficulties there. Nice and light. And here's all the stuff. The uh, rotator controller, there's some hardware gubbins and instructions, and the rotator itself on the right there with some adapting sleeves. All very nicely packaged. I also bought the extra piece of sleeving that goes on the underside of the rotator for pole mounting. And that was, of course, essential in my particular case, as you'll see. Now look at this power connector on the rotator. A shaver plug. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. And it's a metal box as well. Well, um, OK, there is a fuse in the back of this unit, but I decided that that was going to get whipped off straight away. Otherwise, it would just get kicked about. I was worried about the cable not being properly protected. And also, I did think that it would be very nice if the supplier in this country for these products would actually mention that it's not a Pucker UK plug. But needless to say, there's one on there now. Here's the rotator, uh, now constructed, and on the left-hand side you can see the base mount which comes with the Matsoni loop, and I'm just doing some measurements to make sure that I get all the right lengths on the coupling tubes and things that would be necessary to get the loop up to the best height. Here's some uh, Ultraflex 7 coax, very good, nice and bendy, very high quality and very easy to solder as well. That's what I decided to use. And here's the DC cable. I went for 40 amp cable. They suggest quite fat cable for a long run, as in my particular case, and that came as a 50 metre drum. This is a CIV connector that goes from between the icom radio and the loop controller and it means that the radio can tell the loop controller what frequency to tune to but we'll see more about that in the video coming up and here's some fantastic drain pipe 25 meters long i ran this all the way down the garden because i decided to dig a trench that was all the way down the center of the garden drop all the cables into this drain pipe and then drop the pipe into the ground and put the turf back on top Here's the loop antenna, and I put a Coke bottle, a two-litre Coke bottle, next to it so you can see how big the box was, but it did fit into the boot of my saloon car along with all the other bits and pieces when I went to pick them up. But it is, without doubt, a big box, so uh, you do need to work out the transport. OK, to get the box open, you pull out these pins from one end and then you slide out this sort of extraordinary coffin of um, polystyrene with the loop antenna in two halves in it. And you can see also in there, there's a, a special accessories box, uh, in a se separate cardboard box. We'll come back and have a look into that in a minute. Look at the veins of the capacitor. There's your Coke bottle again. Look at the size of the capacitor. Absolutely enormous. Uh, you start to realise this is quite an industrial installation. Okay, in the box then of the accessories, beautifully packaged by the way, uh, all very nice. You've got all kinds of things, power supply for the loop controller, the instructions on a CD, you've got the hardware necessary with the tools you need as well in the kit. Uh, there's also there a keyboard pad and even some oxide paste to make the antenna waterproof in the connections that you're going to be making when you construct it outside. And as you can see here, a certificate comes with all the details of your specific antenna testing. Now look at this for a power connector. Once again, it's the old shaving socket connector. And then uh, this bizarre thing, which looks like a 13 amp plug, but it's absolutely marvellous. Um, it's supplied with the kit, but look, you open it up and then you have to sort of squash the two pin into these two prongs. There's a three amp fuse there, admittedly, and then shut the whole thing down. Oh dear, oh dear. That looked to me like a very dangerous situation. Is there going to warm up or what? Anyway, let's go to the mechanical construction. Okay, well, here we are in the garden trying to dodge the rain, and in front of us you can see the pole that I'm proposing to mount the loop on. It's actually quite a slim diameter, however, it's a very thick walled pole and it is concreted into the ground, so I think it will take the combined weight of the loop and the rotator, which I calculate to be about 20 kilos. Now, it's just a little under 40 metres from the shack, so if we zoom round to the house, the shack 
is the middle window that you can see upstairs in the house there and I'm just hoping that all the cables are going to reach from there to the loop location. Now I've calculated the length of the pole required here is 145 centimeters because when you add that to the rotator and up to the base of the loop the entire construction should be two meters off the ground at the base of the loop in the middle of where Ciro Mazzoni recommends and you can see that I've run out the absolute limiting cable which is the rotator uh, eight core cable which is exactly 40 meters long i've run it all the way from the loop with a generous coil left here all the way up to the shack and inside the shack to where i'm expecting to put the controller for the rotator and at 40 meters it just about fits so i'm going to have to be very careful to be economic with how i run the cables okay well we've now moved to the position where we've got the rotator on the pole and uh, the coupling scaffold link, just a short piece of scaffolding, up to the actual mount which comes with the loop. And at the moment, everything is sort of squared up on the garden, which is very approximately north, south, east, west, actually. But I'm very well aware that I'm going to have to undo some of these once we start to align the rotator. And uh, also when we want to make absolutely sure that the loop itself is facing north on its main forward facing lobe. So, so far so good. One thing that has become quite apparent is that by the time you've got everything piled up on the pole, it's all fine as far as centre of gravity is concerned, but it's also got quite high and I don't want to be working above head height. So without a doubt, uh, this is a two man job, not on a windy day, to actually put the loop onto the pole. So I'm going to do that next. Okay, that's uh, one half up, following the instructions, of course, in the instruction manual. One thing that I did find was that the mounting bolts that uh, you uh, bolt onto the bottom bracket with, there's quite a lot of movement in there, uh, left and right, so you need to square up the antenna before you tighten that up. But anyway, there is the first half up on the pole. Okay, the other half of the construction is now on, and I think it's uh, very well worth reminding you that this is actually a three-way activity. First of all, you've got to make sure that the capacitor vanes are pushed in, and they're rubbing against uh, some bushes nylon type bushes so you do need a bit of force to push them in get them in the center and the second thing you need to do is to put the pin through uh, this pin here and um, you certainly are going to need a light hammer ideally a plastic or a, a rubber hammer to tap the pin through because the fitting is quite tight and so you're doing all of that while you're actually supporting the second half of the antenna itself and you're also up a ladder just to remind you again definitely a two-man job and then finally it'll all fall down again unless you also attach the actuator arm here and again that is whilst at the top of a ladder I'm really not too sure how tight to tighten that I got the impression that it needs to move so I didn't tighten it too much anyway so far I think so good Okay, so just about the last piece of the mechanical construction is to get this coupling blade uh, pinned into place down there. It's pretty springy, it's going to be a bit tough to put it on, I think. And also, before it goes on, we need to put the antioxidant paste along this surface here, which has been roughed up at the factory. So I'm going to do that and see how easy it is at the top of my ladder. Okay, right, well, they're in. I wasn't really sure how much of this antioxidant paste to put on, but I put a fair lather looking at the other side, which was done at the factory. There's a fair bit on there, so I did the same. Just to say that it's quite difficult getting your finger around the back for the middle bolt, by the way. You've got to be careful you don't start dropping everything onto the floor, otherwise you'll be searching in the grass for ages for those washers. Anyway, I've done that up quite tightly.
Okay, another day, a much windier day, but I've now run in all the cables between the shack and the loop. There's the red and black DC motor control, the grey one is the rotator control, and the black is Ultraflex 7 coax. There's no particular sort of suggestions of how you should run the cable up to the loop itself. I tried to make it quite neat at the top and I will make it neat at the bottom. There is one instruction uh, which is that uh, you shouldn't put any coils in the cable if you can help it. I'm going to go up a ladder and show you the connections in a little bit more detail. Okay so here we are first of all the PL259 on the gamma match. Now that seems to be fine. Something that uh, I didn't see anything about any instructions is that on the side of the termination box uh, they kindly provided a couple of holes uh, and a small cable tie which I have seen in other videos appears to take the coaxial cable and keep it neat around the side of the box. The DC cable, and I'm using the fat 40 amp stuff as recommended for this long 35 metre run, goes through this hole here and now there is a, um, a rubber gland in here and for this fatness of cable it was very very tight to get it on and then to get it in position and to tighten this up but it's certainly waterproof but it was quite tough. If you have a look at the actual connection and I use the inside of that cable tie to keep the cables neat, nice big chocolate block uh, and the blue thing uh, is a choke I'm assuming to stop issues with RF getting along the DC motor cable. So broadly speaking that is now the installation. Um, one thing that I ought to just mention about all these cables, whilst the rotator control cable is fixed position on the lower half of the rotator, both the DC and the coax going up to the loop are on the rotating part and therefore I realised that I did need to leave a significant amount of additional cable and make sure with the help of somebody else that when the rotator goes all through its 360 degrees uh, none of these cables can get snagged and uh, I will eventually make this a bit neater but at the moment I'm just leaving them hanging loose so that there's no issue. Right at long last I think it's time to head off into the shack and see what the hell happens next. Okay folks, welcome to the G4HPE shack. Just to orientate you, uh, here is the ICOM 7610 that we'll be using for some testing. Uh, just above it, uh, past the MFJ noise eliminator, is the loop antenna controller itself. We'll take a much closer look at that in just a few moments. And just over here on top of my analog ATU, the trusty MFJ is the rotator control unit. Just on the desk in front at the moment, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to put this in the end, here is the keyboard associated with the loop antenna controller and you can see that that's already plugged in on the front of the unit. Right, let's take a look behind. Here we are, it's not that easy to show you the unit whilst it's actually installed but I've tipped it forwards. Here is the cable going off to the ICOM radio and here is the incoming coax from the loop antenna out in the garden. Uh, this connector here is an RS232 connector which connects to the CIV controller of the radio and I'm going to come back to that later. Uh, there's the DC power brick plugs in there on the end of the unit and this is the power supply uh, for the motor going from this controller out to the loop. While I've got the unit pulled forwards, I've just unplugged the DC supply to the motor on the loop. This is what controls the movement of the actuator arm on the loop. I wanted to point out a couple of things about this. First of all, it's non-locking. It could easily fall out in the shack, I think. And the other thing is, look how small it is. Look how small the connections are. There's an enormous great big chocolate block on the loop, but this is a really tiny connector going into the back of the loop controller, yet it carries the vital DC signals. And you may remember from the documentation, you're supposed to use the fattest cable you can, especially on a long run like me, about 40 metres. And so therefore this very fat cable doesn't really fit terribly comfortably in the connector. 
in the end, I uh, cut some of the copper uh, conductor and I tinned the whole thing with solder and it has gone in. And I think it's safe, but the chances of a short there are not exactly unlikely. So that did surprise me. Anyway, let's put the unit back into place and actually start playing. OK, here we are in the shack with the loop controller and its keyboard. You must have the keyboard plugged in, otherwise the loop controller won't do very much. Everything's wired up to the loop, but this box doesn't know what loop it's got. Let's turn it on. Get a welcome message and the firmware version, which is quite handy. And then a default factory setting. It doesn't really know where it is. It hasn't spoken to the loop because it doesn't know which loop it's got. It could be the MIDI, it could be the Stealth, but in this case, it's the baby loop. We need to teach this box what loop it's got. So let's go into the menu by pressing down minus and holding it. Auto mode, nothing to do with us at the moment. We'll come back to that. But if we press the plus key for the next item, set antenna type. That's what we want to do, so we press enter. The facility it offers, first of all, is Auto Detect. This is really handy. It tests your DC motor connection to make sure it's the correct polarity and will correct it if not. It also moves the veins of the capacitor around on the loop to work out the maximum and minimum frequency that it can operate on. And it does some motor checks as well. So this is what we want to do. It's the easiest thing. So let's just press Enter and away we go. It's going to check the motor. Then it's going to open the veins of the capacitor which will go to the highest frequency that it can operate on. It's done a quick frequency scan to check what that frequency is. Now it's closing the veins. See the motor operating, the blue light. It's then going to do some tuning. The red light never transmits while the red light is on, by the way. It realizes it's got a baby or stealth loop, and it's now going to do a final motor check and then default the device to 6600 uh, kilohertz with an SWR of 1.1 to 1. We're ready to go. OK, I'm sure what you want to do now is to see the loop actually tuning in. I tuned my radio to 14.255 megs, 14255. There's a guy way, way in the background there. But of course, the loop hasn't tuned. Now, to tune the loop automatically, you simply press the star key and enter the frequency of interest, 14255. Press Enter. The loop is now tuning. It's going from 6600 kilohertz to 14255 kilohertz. You can hear it in the receiver. Motor working and tuning happening. It's iterating either side of the frequency that's required. And when it's satisfied, it'll stop and display the standing wave. One and a half to one. Oh, he's just disappeared, but that guy was pretty loud, I think. certainly landed on the 20 meter band no doubt about it manual tuning is a slightly different process you press the oblique key until it changes to offer you set frequency just the same put it in again 14255 but this time when you enter the tuning signal automatically starts operating and so now it's in the test mode if you like now you can use one and seven for fine tuning of the capacitor veins two and eight for not quite so fine and three and nine for coarse so i'll just try with the very finest settings although we're not going to get much better than 1.1 to 1 if i press the seven just dabbing it a couple of times and boom, suddenly it's shot up to five to one. The Q is extremely high. So I think we'll probably leave it at that. And you can see that it has gone higher. Let's retune it back to the uh, original frequency. 14255, enter, and away we go. 1.2 to 1, that'll do. And there's a 5, 9 plus 10 dB signal to prove it. There's one other facility to show you on the controller before we actually move down to the radio. And it's that business that we saw earlier. If we go into the menu and press the minus button, set auto mode. Well, what's this about? This will take a signal from the radio, whatever the particular type of connection it is, a Yesu, a cat, or in the ICOM case, in my case, the CIV connection. It will take that on the back of the controller from the radio, and now we can set it in the mode where the loop antenna controller will simply follow wherever you go on the radio. So let's say yes by enter, 
Okay, at the moment it's disabled. Well, we don't want it to be disabled, so let's hit the plus button. Full auto means it will simply follow the radio. If I press the plus button again, a semi-auto. It will tell you when the loop is off tune, but it will leave you to manually retune. Well, we don't really want that, so minus button, back to full auto, let's say yes. Okay, icon mode already pre-selected, it seems to have found the radio, so we'll say yes to that. And then it'll say the bode rate, which is the speed of the connection on the CIV. Well, that's already set to 19200, so we'll say yes. It's now doing an ID search. This is the hexadecimal address of the CIV connection. OK, well, it's currently looping through all the potential addresses to find the radio. You only have to do this once, by the way. There we are. It's found the ICOM on address 98. So I will say yes by enter. And now we'll find that the radio and the controller are joined together. At the moment, we're on 14255 kilohertz. If I retune the radio, I'm just tuning a little bit up the band to, let's say, 265 approximately. When I stop tuning, the controller automatically starts to retune to the new frequency for you. And it's found it at an SWR of 1.1 to 1. I'm going to go down the band. While I'm tuning, moving the dial around, there's no communication. It's only when I come to rest on a new frequency. Let's have a look. What's this? Uh, 14230 approximately. It's going to retune for me. taking just a little while to iterate backwards and forwards to find the best possible match. A 1.5 to 1, not too bad. Oh, it sounds like a TV signal, as you might expect on 14230. If I simply change bands completely to 7 megs just by pressing the 7 meg button, it will realise and jump to 7160. Now the loop's got to go quite away from 14 megs to 7 megs, but that didn't take very long. It's just about there, just inching backwards and forwards on the capacitor, standing wave of 1.2 to 1. Just one final thing to add, by the way. If you want it to retune at any time, but stay on the same frequency, you simply hit the enter button again it'll have another little retune for you. This might be handy if perhaps uh, it's raining and the match can change slightly, but it's a very quick way of making sure that you're absolutely tuned up. Just hit the enter key. Well, of course, it's performance that you're interested in. What I've got on the ICOM radio here is my doublet at 12 and a half meters above the ground, operating through the first receiver. And on the second receiver, I've got the loop at one and a half metres above the ground. Identical settings on both systems. Um, now, there's obviously a signal there. OK, well, it's a G station talking, I think, to a Yankee Bravo Indonesia. So we'll see in a moment. But of course, there's nothing on the loop because the loop isn't yet set up. First of all, it's on 20 metres. So I'm going to enter the correct frequency, first of all by pressing the star button. I know you can't see me doing this, but it's just the same process. 21245. And the loop is now tuning to the same frequency. You can see the tuning signals in the receiver. Well, he's there on the loop, but he's not very loud. But of course, there's another process you've got to go through, which is you've got to beam round to Indonesia, which is 80 degrees. So I'm just going to move the rotator. Again, I know you can't see me doing this, but you'll have to take my word for it. I'm moving it round to 80 degrees for Indonesia. Right, it's there now. But what I've also found is that you should very quickly retune the loop a second time. So I'm just going to do that just by hitting the Enter key. And there's a little bit of signal going on. I think that's the Brit. 1.2 to 1 on the loop.
So the the UK guys are a lot stronger on my doublet. Well, that's the Yankee Bravo. Now, he's not quite as strong as he was before, but you can see that, comparatively speaking, he's holding up his own on both antennas, and considering that the loop is only a metre in diameter and very, very much lower than the doublet, not a bad signal. Well, that's not bad. He was getting up to S7 on both antennas, and at times the loop was leading. I, I, that's just a random example that I picked, but uh, the band is just about dying at this time of the day. It's uh, half past five in the evening. Uh, but I'll try and uh, pick one more demonstration for you. OK, here's another example for you. This is an Echo Alpha station, so I've beamed up on him. I've retuned the loop. I'm just going to retune the loop one more time on this frequency. There she goes. Seems to be a combination of tone and wideband noise going on here. Don't understand the mechanism, but there we are. But this station down in Spain is pretty strong on the loop. There he is. From Catalonia, not less from Spain. My working conditions. Is it the king or T is nine four zero? Now you can see that he's S nine plus on the loop and only S seven on the doublet, ten meters above it. Now, it's a pretty dramatic example of how much stronger stations can be on the loop. But just want to show you, finally, if I tune away, uh, that's to say, not tune away, I mean move the um, rotator around to 90 degrees. So the side lobe, which is the rejecting side, is pointing towards the Spanish station. Let's see how much uh, stronger he is or otherwise. Yes, I mean, compared to his S9+, Plus, he's now dropped down to about the same as the uh, the doublet. So, uh, quite a good example, I think. Uh, just one other example for you. A Sugar 5.7 Delta X-ray, very often to be found with a very, very big signal. Here we are now on 17 metres, 18 megs. And here he is, on the loop. And on the doublet. The other thing that you might notice is that there's a lot of noise on the doublet, either side of his signal, although he's a bit wide. Uh, it's much cleaner on the loop. And if you listen on the loop, it's a much more pleasant listen. OK, now here's something a little bit weird, which I'm still trying to come to terms with. In the instructions for the antenna, you know that the forward-facing lobe is in the direction of the gamma match. In other words, sideways out of the coin, absolutely not through. It's sideways, and there's a big black arrow on the instructions that say that the gamma match, this thing here, is the bit that faces forward. But I started to notice that all the signals, when there was some directionality to them, appeared to be stronger on what is the back of the beam. And I spent about three days looking at loads and loads of stations, finding out their beam heading from QRZ.com, and then pointing the antenna front and then back at these stations. And consistently, it was the other way that way that was the strongest signal what's known as the back of the beam if you like but anyway i'm so convinced that it is the other way around from what Ciro mazzoni says in my particular circumstances here that i've decided to turn the antenna through 180 degrees so now that is the back and that way is the front of the antenna so at the moment in my garden here it's facing north 
So, as I mentioned, it was necessary to keep cable runs as short as possible, and so I dug a trench across the centre of the garden. The cables were initially laid on the grass in order to test the loop, and then for installation they were pulled through a drainage pipe and dropped into the trench. A bit of sand at the bottom of the trench would help with drainage. The pipe emerges at the base of the loop mast, and after a back-breaking day of earth moving, the trench was filled in. i found that some people can become quite starry-eyed to protect a purchase they've made, and some videos I've seen about these loops have been perhaps a little bit too gushing. But I hope what follows strikes a balance. The unit comes in excellent packaging, and the loop is beautifully made, solid engineering, and definitely built to last. It's all pretty industrial, and the loop is bigger and heavier than you think until you're standing in front of it. You really do need two people to put it all together, in situ, safely. The loop controller unit sometimes seems to do strange things. For example, random error messages, and in particular, for some reason, getting the polarity of the DC motor cable the wrong way round, so that when you press to open the loop, it actually closes. If this happens, the best thing to do is disconnect and reconnect the loop controller power supply, and then go through the initialization sequence afresh. The standing wave ratio on all bands is less than 1.4 to 1, except on 10 metres, where it seems to be 1.9 to 1 in my case. Still kind of OK, but unexpected, so I need to look at why this is. The Q of the antenna is, as expected, extremely high, so even very small changes in frequency will require a quick retune. Even when all you do is rotate the antenna, you should still retune for the new environment. And beware that some very high RF voltages and currents may be present in the vicinity of the loop. It's your responsibility to ensure that no one can get too near while you're transmitting, particularly because it can handle high output powers. And I'm pretty sure it must be mounted in the clear for decent performance. Generally, signals on the 40 meter band are down a bit in strength compared to my doublet, but bearing in mind the doublet is 10 meters above the loop and it's a large antenna cut for the lower HF bands. The loop provides a quite remarkable performance given its mere diameter of 1 meter and height above the ground of 2 meters. Very importantly, the loop controller does not revert to straight through operation when switched off. This is a pity because it means that you cannot leave it in the RF path if you're using a different antenna. Also, the loop must go between the radio, running 200 watts or less, and a linear. But the loop controller is extremely fussy about the coaxial route between the controller and the loop, and it really doesn't take kindly to joins and switches. One thing which I've been repeatedly warned about is that the loop controller antenna connection has an RF amplifier on it. And there is a risk of burning it out if you use another antenna which is physically close to the loop on a similar frequency. To guard against this, I had a plan for using a switch system to bypass and earth the loop controller when it wasn't in play, but the loop controller threw a fit and wouldn't tune. So this is a plan still in process. Does it work? Well, in my case, yes, it does. And quite amazingly at times, I am genuinely surprised at the performance. If you have a small plot or grumpy neighbours and can only put up something relatively discreet and near to the ground, this loop should give you a surprisingly good experience. Tuning is hypercritical, but the loop controller takes all the hard work out of that. Manual tuning hardly ever realises a better match. The standing wave ratio on almost the whole published range is manageably low and often very low. You really should invest in a rotator to optimise the potential of this antenna because the ability to beam at the desired target and eliminate noise to the side really is effective. I have found that the background noise on the loop is obviously lower on all bands except 20 metres for some reason. But if you're looking to hear very weak signals, the rejection of man-made noise can make all the difference between copy and no copy. The installation instructions are pretty comprehensive, they're written in good English, and the large number of photographs are very helpful. The instruction booklet is available online if you don't have a CD player. The price tag is a bit daunting. 
but if all you have room for is a modest low antenna, I'd say it was potentially good value compared to some other options. And in my case, despite being lucky enough to have plenty of room and dipoles in the clear, I will definitely be favouring the loop for the directional and low noise benefits it brings. I'm going to have a lot of fun with the on-air testing now, and with Sunspot Maximum still several years away, I think I now have a better facility than I've ever had on the higher HF bands.